complicated, you know, man. I got down Rubik's cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then like man. All right, Dave Martell, welcome to the Jay. Welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, vibing. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, there, there's a there's a number of people, and and thankfully it's getting fewer and fewer who I, I can't believe I haven't had on yet. Right, almost to 200 episodes, and, and we've never spoken. But I aim to fix that. So yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So uh, if someone in my audience maybe isn't familiar with with who you are or what you do, how do you describe your work? So I am, oh man. Um, so I guess I'm a, a creative in some ways. I guess that, that doesn't sound too pretentious. I am a publisher. I am the, I'm the editor in chief of the Bizarre Archives, Weird Tales of Monsters, Magic and Machines, which is a pulp publication that uh, publishes authors, new and old, contemporary and from the uh, elder years in the, the literary traditions of cosmic horror sword and sorcery and science fiction i am also one half of culture dads which is a podcast i do with mike from imperium press where we have two base dads do deep dives into retro and pop culture and history and philosophy and theology and all kinds of interesting stuff for folkish and dissident minds i am also a lead designer on a video game project called grim earth which is an action adventure um kind of hack and slash fantasy game I am a, um, I'm all over the place. I do a little bit of music. I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm all over the place. A lot of stuff. Yeah, that was, that was a great intro. You really, you covered all our bases there. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I've heard you on interviews before and, and one of the things that, you know, I find admirable, right. Is that, you know, there's a lot of media analysis in our sphere, right. And some of that's, some of that's useful, but a lot of it sort of comes down to complaining about current things. You know, I don't like yeah. X, Y, Z property and like, don't get me wrong. They're completely right. You know, that, that thing is garbage, but uh, it's a little bit frustrating if there, there's no fruit from it. And so uh, I admire your ability to basically, you know, build your own, you know, like you've said, you, you certainly published a lot of literature, you know, you're, you're working on a game. You know, there's a, another project as well. And uh, honestly, man, I just want to say, I find it particularly impressive, but how do you get started in this? Right. You know, you, you said that you were creative, but. You know, what kind of pushed you to, to start the Bizarre Archives and, and end up where we are now? So uh, the Bizarre Archives started, um, well, I started out, uh, what really motivated me was it was COVID. It was the lockdowns. I had a particularly rough patch during that. I lost my job and um, I lost everything. Yeah, you know, we, me and my wife had a nest egg. We we're getting ready to buy a house. She was pregnant with our third child. We just like, it was, it was bad. We were in the dumps and I was like, I gotta, I gotta pull something out. You know, there wasn't really any, anywhere good hiring. I, it was just, it was a tough time. So I was like, I gotta pull something out. So I took $200 I'd left over for my stimulus check and I started the bizarre archives and, um, you know, here we are, we're, uh, you know, we've sold thousands of books all over the world. We are we're really doing pretty well. Um, so I can't complain with that, but what really, really started it for me was, I, w I can't remember what it was about. I was on a thread somewhere. I was being a reply guy about something that I love. I can't remember if it was a film or a, a book or a game or something that I loved that was paused out. And I got into the replies, bitching and moaning. And some smarmy, leftoid, libtoed douchebag says, Yo, you don't like it, make your own. Well, I, I was like, all right, deal. So I went and I made my own and I'm, I just had the philosophy of every time somebody, something or the powers that be destroy something that I love that brought pleasure and, and fun and joy to my life. Every time they, they screw it up and pause it and poison it and rot it out and make it gay and silly and terrible. I'm just going to make my own every single time. You can't stop me. So that's where we're at. That's what I do. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, I don't want to get too you know, in the weeds about the philosophical stuff, right? But, you know, Nick Land has this idea, right, that the left is basically entropy. They just destroy. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of us, you know, ended up here one way or another because of Gamergate. I guess I did, Dave. I've said this before on my podcast, but I showed up to university, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and uh, I, I signed up for a game theory class. And I thought, you know, that's going to be like nerdy economic stuff. 
oh no no i signed up for critical theory of video games and had a a, a blue haired just toad of a woman oh. literally teach me gamergate at a college level and uh that radicalizes you real real fast right you sort of sit yeah. there and you're like well i don't i don't know what i am but whatever you hate those are my friends and so like look i wasn't around for gamergate but it is you know partially responsible for how i ended up here but nonetheless, right, you know, we, we've all seen things that we like or grew up with. You know, it's sort of like the, the darkness from Never Ending Story, right? It just eats it all. And yeah. uh, I, I think there are a lot of guys who get kind of stuck in that cul-de-sac of just saying thing bad. You know, like, oh, this thing used to be good and now it's bad. And again, it's true. But uh, not only is it depressing, but just endlessly complaining about it doesn't make anything better. Right, you sort of almost become the the product. They like making you mad, and yeah. uh, you know I think that attitude of like, fine, like you know, you, I can't stop you from ruining it, but I can do my own thing is a is a really positive and healthy one. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I, I'm interested in, right, is you know your your magazine, you know, where you you publish kind of up and comers. So what is it about the publishing industry? that made, you know, that makes what you're doing unique because it seems like, right. You know, this is a business model that used to exist. You know, there were weird tales, any number of these, like where did all those go and, and what is the current way that, that publishing works? So I can't really speak to exactly the nuts and bolts to how mainstream publishing works, but I can tell you that whatever they're doing is not doing a good job because they are hemorrhaging money. A bunch of data got leaked. Uh, somewhat sort of recently uh, from, I believe it was Tor Books, I believe it was Tor Books, uh, about how little they sell. They Most of these big publishing companies are propped up by a handful of their sacred cows. Uh, their big names that I'm sure everybody here has heard, you know, I guess guys like Stephen King or, or you know, uh, Dean Koontz or, and then like the whole bottom 80% of authors that they publish sell nothing. And then I really realized this on Twitter when I was when I first got on when I first got on Twitter with my Bizarre Archives account. Follow me on Twitter at the Bizarre Archives. Um, uh, when certain authors that were supposedly these big shot signed uh, you know, authors were coming at me talking a bunch of crap, and I'd go and I'd look, and they said you know twenty five thousand followers or whatever, and then every single one of their posts were minimal engagement. We're talking three, four, five people are engaging with their posts. Uh, only like a, maybe a hundred would, would see. And I was like, these people are completely astroturfed. So I go and I start doing some more research. Turns out some of these people sell less books than I do. And I was like, that ain't right. So the whole thing is completely fake. It's completely fake and gay. They're not selling what they say they're selling. They're not making the money that they say they're making. And they're not doing as good as they say they are. Nobody's buying their books. You know, they go, they put their books into, uh, you know, um, Barnes and Noble or whatever's out there now, books a million, and they sit there and they collect dust. Nobody goes into those those stores anymore. the 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 old model of of publishing is is very 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 old and outdated. People just aren't buying books like that. So as a collective whole, indie publishing it makes up a majority of the market of sold books nowadays. Most most publishers are self published. So this idea that Simon and Schuster or, or uh, Penguin Random House, the I believe I can't remember what the, the big four, the big five, big three, they keep buying each other up. Eventually, it's going to be the big one. Um, these guys are just they're fugazi. They're not, you know, they're not even competing now. Obviously, you know, alt publishing or underground publishing, indie publishing, whatever you want to call it, uh, collectively uh, is giving them a run for their money. Amazon, whether you like them or not has really delivered them a death blow by letting guys like me get on there and sell books, you know, sell them, you know, I get on, sell through my website, a little bit of savvy, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of social media presence, do a few interviews, build up these avenues, build up some, some awareness. And through my website, through, through Amazon, through all the different, the different channels, I'm selling more books than 80% of, of these, uh, you know, publishers are doing. I mean, we're not making millions, but we're making. You know, it's not. It's not really a. I mean, it's about money because you got to keep the business going. But it's not really about that. It's it's about dealing a blow to the people that have ruined the things that we've loved, and that's why I'm getting into other things as well. Gaming, 
you know, we're about to shoot a, actually this weekend, I'm going to start doing, we're about to shoot a film, a short film. So we got a lot of stuff in the works. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you bring up traditional book retailers, right? Cause if you ever known someone who's, who's worked there, right. You realize that they actually destroy the vast majority of books there. You know, they're, they're they, it's too expensive to ship them back. So they cut off the covers and just throw them out to be pulped. And exactly. you know, once you realize that, you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Like I couldn't run a business like that. You couldn't run a business like that. But you, know, you realize that these are really barely bookstores anymore, right? Like you go into a place like Barnes and Nobles and, you know, maybe it's 30% books and then it's, you know, like home house goods and Funko Pops and Legos and stuff. Yeah. You know, all this kind of like other like ephemera. And uh, yeah, you, you start to realize like, wait a minute, this industry doesn't make sense. And I, I didn't realize that there's actually data behind it. I just had kind of had a vague gut feeling, right? This doesn't add up. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, I'll put it this way. Couldn't happen to nicer people. Like I'll, I'll shed a tear <laughs> right, when, yeah. they, when they can no longer do what they do. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, the other interesting things in that, right, is, and you see the same thing in music, right, is how much old media makes up what is currently consumed yeah right you know like the the relative market share for new music is dramatically lower than what it ever has been you know okay yeah sure kanye west sells more records than the beatles but if you compare kanye west to the world population to what the beatles were selling you know back in the 60s it's a it's a order of magnitude difference and you yeah. see the same thing now as well right where it's like herbert still sells tolkien still sells you know, whatever tour is has sort of squeezed out and packaged for you, uh, doesn't sound like it's it's selling. And uh, you know, I think it's interesting too. And look, like I've got a I've got friends in publishing, like you know, Bagby, who kind of you know he offers like really niche academic stuff. But the sort of things that's actually worth reading, right? That that's interesting and specific that isn't made for you know the ultimate mass market. Like there is a there's a real like that that is a, there is demand for that. And I think that you know the type of indie publishing that you're talking about you know we've interviewed other people from that sphere is is a really really positive development but uh I, i'm curious you know you mentioned your game do you want to describe sort of you know what that is and sort of how that's uh kind of an interesting creative development well, our, our video game or our tabletop game uh video game we'll get to the tabletop game in a little bit yeah, sure. So our video game is called Grim Earth, and it's based off of a, an intellectual property. That's where the money is. That's where the key is, uh, in building intellectual properties. Uh, people really love intellectual properties. So, uh, and I know that sounds kind of that sounds kind of clinical and globo homo, but uh, intellectual property is like a universe of stuff. So one of the intellectual properties that I've created is called Grim Earth. And it's a it's a fantasy. It's like a grim fantasy dark fantasy sword and sorcery type setting and uh it is being developed by my good buddy mr four who's by the way he's an excellent musician excellent makes a lot of great dungeon synth music and rock and metal music really really talent just really talented guy um he is the lead developer on this and we put this thing together and we're like we want to make a video game so we're making a 3d action adventure hack and slash kind of game uh, one of my problems with the video game market is it's they make these gigantic bloated crap games that are nothing but fetch quests and time sinks. And I wanted to go the opposite way, make games that I used to love in that style. Games like, uh, you know, Gauntlet Legends, games like Diablo, the first one or two games, games where they didn't. I mean, you could spend a lot of time on them. But if you want to sit down and pop, and pop it out, it's not tons of cutscenes. It's not bloated budgets. It's not, there's no pause or the message TM isn't in there. It's just fun. It's just a fun game. You know, shout out, speaking of fun games, shout out my boy Colt Games, making that uh, great rebellion game. He, he, they're killing it. Great stuff. And here's the deal is that folks, folks in our scene of things, I call it the Necromunda, right? We're going to get into talking about 40K. 40K fans are going to know what I'm talking about. The Necromunda, the underworld, we're kind of like the guys, the alt bros, we're the alternative guys, the guys uh, that are sitting in, in our sphere of things. We have plenty of dudes that are talented and have skills and big brains and big imaginations. And all we really require to create these things is a little bit of love, 
Actually, a lot of love. That's what it's all about. And you mentioned before how these creatures that that destroy these things that we love, that's what they're driven by. They're driven. I know this might be sound kind of cringe for some folks to hear or whatever, but th- I mean this. I mean this. These are these are hateful creatures. These are hateful, spiteful mutants that just hate things and they want to destroy things because they're repulsed by things that are uh, orderly and beautiful and good and fun and beloved by people. And we are the opposite. You know, I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a kinsman. I'm a man of faith. I'm a man, you know, I'm a, I'm a creature of love. You know I mean? I love my family. I love these art forms. I love art. I love culture. I love this stuff. I live for it. It's who I am. You know what I mean? And, uh, my, my reaction to them is because that they've, they've trotted upon and disrespected and blasphemed the very things that I love. So I have righteous anger towards them. So I want to unroll what I have inside me, my spirit, my soul, to create things that other people can love and enjoy in, in this period of time that is very dark and very blackpilling and very depressing. You know, they a lot of times I think they buy up IPs and destroy these things just to flex and to demoralize. And I want to remoralize and I want to, instead of making things that are degenerate, make things that are generative. So our video game that we're creating, going back to that, is um, something that's not going to suck up too much of your time. It's something that you could sit down and play and in 15, 20 minutes, have a blast, have fun and, uh, you know, turn it off when you're done. It doesn't suck up all your day. Or if you want to spend a whole day ripping and ripping and tearing and mass murder and goblins and monsters and stuff like that, you could do that, too. Yeah, I think that that's a it's an interesting point, right? You know, that that video games really have have changed as a product. Right. Like, don't get me wrong. There have always been guys. It's, it's like anything. Right. Who sort of can't hold their video games. You know, they're just obsessives by nature. But when you look at you know, and Fortnite's actually a good example, although the same thing has happened to any one of these like live service games where they are deliberately designed by teams of psychologists to be as addictive as possible. Yeah. Where there's sort of these like multiple, you know, reward systems built into hacking your brain. And I noticed this because I'm not a, I don't really enjoy multiplayer games. Right. It's not my jam. But uh, over COVID, right, I was living with a group of guys. Nobody was doing anything. So it's like, all right, we're playing Call of Duty again. And I really hadn't played since, I mean, we're talking like the the early 2010s, right, when I was in middle school. And so that jump was actually kind of useful because my memories of what the product Call of Duty was and the reality what had kind of happened in that 10-year gap was world of difference, Mm -hmm. right? And it was almost like, you know, it was almost like, I felt like I was autistic. Like I was so hyper stimulated. I was like, what in the world is this? You know, there's a sting every 30 seconds. There's like layers upon layers of different things you have to manage and progression and all of these like, like alternating currencies, let alone the fact that they have just put every IP into a blender. And so now it's like Jason Voorhees is like, I don't know, fighting the rock, you know, like (laughs) what in the world is this? And uh, it was almost helpful to see that, that gap. You know, it wasn't like the, the frog slowly boiled. It was like they took the frog out of the water and dumped it in a pot. They're like, okay, well, yeah. I noticed the difference. And, you know, that really, it, it's the same general type of, you know, experience, right? It's just still a, a digital game. But it wants a different thing. For, it wants all of you. It wants your money. It wants your time. It wants your attention. It's just going to suck you, you know, suck you dry. And I think that's sort of an interesting point you bring up about IPs. Because, you know, I think a, a lot of the reason people like IPs right? These like massive universes is you really can just get lost in it. And there's a positive and negative to that. You know, I think that part of the reason they're going after these IPs so much is one, it's a hundred percent spike. I think you're right. You've seen that in what's recently happened in in 40K news, which we'll get into. But also I think they realized that there are a lot of people who are invested, you know, who feel like they've put a lot of time in, they've read a lot of books, they've watched a lot of movies and they almost don't want to give it up. You know, they're willing to sit through something they wouldn't otherwise. You know, I've seen that with Star Wars. Like, I'm not into that stuff. It's not really my thing. But I know guys who are, you know, guys who are otherwise kind of our guys into our sort of politics. And they're like gritting their teeth, hate watching show after show after show, making fun of them, you know, making fun of what they believe. Because it says, you know, Star Wars on the wrapping paper. And uh, I mean, look, like it is both spite. They like doing it. They like that you feel like you have to watch it. And then I think it's a great bully pulpit too, right? These people are kind of ingesting these ideas. But anyway, sorry, I've been talking for 10 minutes. I should probably throw it back to you, right? No, you're you're absolutely right with the the intellectual property thing. People, 
yeah let's be real like you know us as you know guys we we love deep lore we just love it you know what i mean it's just it's just what it is uh we love going in and it's, especially we've been into it for a long time especially if it's nostalgic for us you know, things like star wars do i love star wars we talked about this one before the show i loved star wars when i was a kid dude you know uh, the, the original trilogy and you know what i even i even came around to the prequels after they came out yeah i, lo I loved star wars it was a you know we could we could rip it apart and do a whole analysis of it because effectively it is sort of liberal propaganda you know you got the evil empire and you got the 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 noble rebellion it, and it's basically space world war ii if we're gonna be honest and uh yeah essentially yeah but uh, at the end of the day, that's not what we saw. We saw adventure. We saw uh, action. We saw uh, the the good guys beating the bad guys. We saw somebody that that comes from nothing and rise up, and he was the underdog, and he became something through sh sheer will and might and and courage. And it, the the virtues of Star Wars, just at face value, which were in my opinion sometimes the face value, the stuff at face value is more important which is, you know, courage, standing up for your friends, standing up against that which is evil, you know, standing up against darkness for the light. Like these, these things are, are just inherently good and you can find them in, in most, uh, you know, storytelling traditions going all the way back. Now, obviously, there's a conversation to be had for uh, like um, uh, dualities found in storytelling uh kind of like the the duality of good versus evil is a little bit different and when you get into the stories of the ancient world you know that's a little bit more um more about heroes having blood feuds and settling scores and and uh, so forth uh but you know i think there's room for for both of those styles of storytelling and um because both of them are, are meaningful to us either way long story short when you when you are invested in something like that, like Star Wars or or say, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or or I don't know, Warhammer 40K or like one of these things. And you, you grow up playing the games, you grow up reading the books, you grow up watching the cartoons, you grow up doing that stuff. And then it, it evolves with you as an adult. And there's lots of cool galaxies and deep lore. You can go read about technology and different cultures and languages and alien races or or you know, whatever. That stuff is of interest to us because we we're smart people and smart people enjoy those things, especially if they are imaginative and weird and kind of far flung, um, you know, that which tickles the imagination tickles the soul. And, um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong about being upset that these things that, that there's nothing wrong with being upset that uh, somebody took something that you love and made it trash on purpose. There's nothing wrong with that. But what is the what I do take take uh, issue with are these kind of there is a, a a cast of react reaction people that are effectively just grifters and their whole shtick is to part of me thinks that they're getting paychecks from Disney and and you know whoever uh, to just just mad react to everything and be outraged about it while completely ignoring. Um, Folks that are in the underground scene making making art and making entertainment and making uh, making books, you know, I I there's some of these guys that have really really humongous platforms and all they do is get mad about about books and movies that are coming out and I've tried to reach out to them, yo, bring me on or bring you know and I have friends that are that do the same kind of stuff that I do, creators that are doing this, yo, check us out, check us out, and they just completely ignore us, and then it came, you know, it uh, it, it dawned on me that they will never uh, interview us or talk to us or lift us up because we are uh, detrimental to their business model, right? Whether that be to draw all attention, positive and negative to these, to the, to the big machine or that they, they make money off of selling people black pills that this like misery cycle and to get them invested in the misery cycle that nothing will get better. And the only thing that matters is that you know, this stuff is trash. And uh, us showing that there's an alternative, us showing that there is good stuff underground that you could, you know, I, I've always been an underground guy. You know, I, I've always been this way. You know, I'm a, I'm a heavy metal guy. I grew up listening to extreme metal and, and underground metal. I've always loved underground art and magazines. I'm a DIY dude. I'm I'm Le Eternal Zenial, right? I'm on the cusp. 
between Gen X and millennial. And that's was our thing. You know what I mean? DIY, do things yourself, check out the underground because underground stuff, in my opinion, even if it's a little bit rough, even if it's a little bit uh, unpolished has more heart than what you can find in the mainstream. You know what I mean? Cause those guys in the underground, they don't care about making risks. That's why, that's why the first album is almost always the best album. That's why the first movie is almost always the best movie. That's why the first stuff that the early in the guy's careers are all is usually the best because they, they had that passion. They had that drive and they were underground guys. And once they came into some money, they kind of forgot, forgot what hunger feels like. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, there's plenty of director, like movie directors that made great films throughout the entirety of their career. You know, you could say like Martin Scorsese or, or uh, I don't know, Francis Ford Coppola or, you know, Clint Eastwood or whatever. But for the most part, the first one's always the best. And it's for that reason. So I'm an underground guy, always have been. But there are these guys out there that if it's not in the mainstream, if it doesn't float the currents of the monoculture, then it's not worthy to check out. And you know what? If if uh, I don't know, I just think that they're grifters and they suck. And I think that they're vampires. You know what I mean? And uh, that's just I'm kind of going on a rant here. So I'll pass no, no, it. not at all. Well, I, here's the thing is that I actually feel the exact same way. There's a reason I, I called it a cul-de-sac, right? Because like, look, like that rage is natural, like feeling like, hey, this something is cool and now it's ruined. Like, it's a very human reaction. But, uh, you know, it's there's a certain aspect to it, which is like the stages of grief. And if you stay there forever, it's like you're not really getting past it. You're not really like growing or anything. So I, I want to talk about, you know, when we sort of danced around it and mentioned, you know, both that something has happened in kind of the world of 40K and also that you've been working on your own, own alternative. Right. So, so I'll provide a little bit of, of background. Right, which is first 40k, right? It, it's big in our spheres for a reason. One, yeah. you know, it is it is dark sci-fi fantasy, right? It, it is almost inherently right wing. You know, it is literally it is a world in which the only way to survive for humanity is to become space fascists, right? Almost like a, a ludicrously evil society, and they're the best you got, right? The the poster boys, space marines, are basically battle monks right they're this kind of like fusion of you know arcane technology and, and religious symbolism right it is very very much you know a right-wing universe things like subversion things like evil are real and they will send you to hell right hell is another dimension and it wants to eat your brain and uh you know it's been going on for a long time right a lot of guys get into it both because it has it's kind of coded for our thing and also it's it's a unique thing you know, it has its own tone to it. It's kind of grim, you know, and harsh. And, you know, part of that, right, is that there are a lot of single sex spaces within that. You know, the, the space marines are all men. You know, there are organizations that are all women. You know, it's sort of, as you can imagine, like a, a far future version of medieval society. But the people who own it, right, they're not the same people who like it. You know, they're normal progressive types. And so they feel bad about it. You know, they feel like they're evil people for having a product with single sex spaces. in it. And that's one example. There are others, but that's the kind of the core of the issue. And so, you know, there's been this push by these kind of progressive tourists to make it a gender, gender equal, right? Like, oh, every faction can be, you know, men and women or whatever. And obviously that not only goes against the spirit of it, but it is like, look, this is supposed to be an existential war for the sake of humanity. Like they don't have an HR department. Right. You know, it's, it's worrying about the, you know, that the species going extinct, but nonetheless, yeah. right. The kind of real world pressures have finally won out. You know, the company who produces it has released, you know, material that basically says, you know, X, Y, Z faction, the custodians for people who care, uh, they are, they've always been women. And that was the line, right? Like ever since this started, it's always been there, pure gaslighting. And so that's, that was sort of seen as, you know, the, the gates of the castle have been broken in, you know, it, it's done. And again, right, we can complain about that. But, uh, you know, you've sort of started working on your own thing. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to roll your trailer because it's quite good. And then we will uh, we'll tune back in after that. If that sounds good to you, Dave. Yeah, let's do it.
Hearken unto the annals of yore, where once upon a forgotten epoch, humanity flourished upon a celestial orb of unparalleled grandeur. T'was a realm of power and majesty, basking beneath the gaze of a resplendent sun. Yet as fate's cruel hand would have it, that radiant sphere waned and decayed into a grim black dwarf, soon to perish into oblivion, dragging all of mankind to its annihilation. In the face of impending doom, humanity rallied, constructing a flotilla to voyage across the starry abyss. Only the most elite of our brethren were chosen, destined for a slumber profound within the depths of space, entombed in caskets of cryosleep. And thus our odyssey led us to the hollowed grounds of Nathralis, a bastion amidst the astral firmament, reigning supreme as the cosmic capital and paramount terror state within the Inan realm. During this epoch of renewal that mankind unfurled the veils of Rift Tech, innovating anti-entanglement matrix cores to traverse vast expanses but with a blink, defying the shackles of distance through non-locality manipulation. And behold, our vessels soared upon the currents of magflight propelled by the arcane energies of electromagnetic ferrofluid systems, navigating the cosmic tides at unrivaled velocities. Yet as the eons unfurled their tapestries, shadows crept upon the gleaming spires of progress. The tendrils of corporate hegemony ensnared the populace, weaving in an arco-tyrannical web where corporate vampires held dominion over entire worlds, their subjects mere pawns in the games of power, exploitation, and consumption. Through clandestine machinations, they forged a lineage of blood, breeding a cadre of warrior pilots known as the Usamat, eugenically bred to withstand the rigors of rift travel and mad flight. Thus did humanity scatter across the expanse of the Inan realm, seizing dominion over nine planets and countless moons teeming with the bounty of life. Yet amidst this splendor, the denizens of Nathralis succumbed to opulence and decadence and degeneration, their coffers brimming with wealth amassed over a millennium. Well, man, that is that is quite the trailer. Uh, oh, highly you. impressed. Glad to feature it here. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, that's Red Void. That is a setting that I have uh, been cooking up in my brain for I don't even know how long. Um, it's kind of like a mashup of every you. So pretty much every anybody who's read my stories, has read my stuff. I have multiple little settings that I write right. in, and they're all – in like the back of my mind, I knew that all of these things, not in the back of my mind, in the front of my mind, I very consciously made it. So all of these worlds were part of one timeline, one universe. They're, they're all connected. And um, I was like, you know what? I want to, I want to make my own Warhammer 40 K and I want to put all of this uh, together into one thing. So I, I'm not a very good video editor. So I took a bunch of AI art and just try, I, I wrote a, a script and I was like, I want people to see, you know, what this this crazy universe in my head looks like. So I put together that's one of six, I believe, videos that I put together to give people a primer for the setting. And I have a buddy who's actually he goes by Trollhammer. He's one of my oldest friends. Me and him have been buddies since I don't know, high school. Yeah, I'm 30, I'm gonna be 37. So however long that was. Uh, me and him have been cooking up homebrew systems and games and stuff for a long time, and he does 3D modeling, and he's really big into war gaming. So I was like, "Yo, dude, let's let's finally put this, let's finally do it together." So we started, you know, cooking up this universe, and I actually get the title was different. A kinsman of mine actually said he this is this get kind of esoteric, 
but he he called me up and he goes and this was like the, a couple days after me and my other buddy started cooking this up he goes yo i had a dream that you created this entire like intellectual property and it was like this crazy sci-fi universe sort of like 40k and you had all these minis and you had this big like uh you had this big event where you you like rolled everything out and there's all kinds of people there he's like and it was called uh it was called red sun is what he said it was called so i was like all right well i got the original working title was void c so i was like I got to combine. That's a, that's an omen of some kind that you had this dream. He had no idea I was doing this. So I was like, all right, I got to I got to bring this together. This is some kind of omen. So I called it Red Void. And Red Void is going to be this all encompassing intellectual property that has um, that has uh, a tabletop war game that has books and novels. I already have, I have writers. You know, I have a whole stable of awesome authors from the Bizarre archives. I'm going to get them on it. So we're going to have like our own Horus Heresy kind of you know, book set and all kinds of extra literature. We're going to have uh, just all of the stuff that goes into an, an IP uh, card game, freaking everything. So it's going to be, it's going to be an intellectual property. We're hoping to actually get into doing film with it too. So we're going to have an, uh, everything involved with this and um is going to bring it all to life and if we talked about the lore we would we could be here i could like ramble about it for hours and hours so we're not going to do that but uh red void right now it's just like some videos on my youtube uh with some ai art and some music and me doing oration i actually do a little voice acting in there too but uh you can go check that out but uh, very soon we will be rolling out miniatures that people can buy uh through uh and uh like a rule book like a core book that people can buy and play this game and whether you like reading lore whether you like painting and collecting miniatures whether you like playing tabletop war games whether you're like an old guy gaxi and uh, rpg tabletop guy we got you covered it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah it's uh it was sort of a a godsend in timing Right, you know, 40k has been having more and more problems, and that really is the coke of the tabletop war gaming. I guess both in the in the cola and in the Colombian sense of that word. Uh, but you know, it's it sort of uh, I think it's something that needed to happen. You know, there has been an ex explosion of kind of indie indie war games, but you know, we mentioned that a lot of this subversion is deliberate spite. And uh, actually, I had a uh, I had a tweet that I wanted to show. Because you know that this this shows exactly what I am am talking about, right? And obviously, you know, this is representative of others. But I think it's important to to bring up, you know, because this is important both because the product is getting worse, and also, you know, you should not fund people who talk about you like this, right? So pull that up on screen. Uh, this is by a, uh, a a beyond woman, I believe. Uh, it yeah. brings so much joy to know that you feel like all your favorite hobbies are being stripped away from you. You will never get what you think you had back. And that is hilarious, right? Again, mm -hmm. we see the kind of spear, pure, you know, destruction and spite in that. And so if you have the option, right, if this is your thing and uh, you, you don't give money to that guy, right? Don't, don't give money to that guy for any number of reasons, but they very clearly hate you. So, uh, you know, it's maybe enough said about that, but you know, when it comes to you know coming up with your own sci-fi setting, I will say one: if anyone can pull it off, it's you, right? You have the track oh, record for it. You. But you know, what are the sort of the themes and the, uh, the I guess like the archetype you wanted to pull from from other kind of sci-fi settings and and bring into your own that you think are are worth saving? I guess. So there are a few tried and true, familiar um, tropes in this type of genre. So we have to kind of make a little bit of a distinction between this genre and, say, uh, standard science fiction. So what we're talking about here is a, a, a space opera or a planetary romance, which is which is going to be different than a, a, a science fiction. Science fiction is a um, is sort of science fiction is very beautiful because it is um, it is mythopoetic for us in modernity and when i say myth when you talk about mythopoetic you generally talk about fantasy because that which is mythopoetic is that uh, which concerns itself with the primordial origins of a people and their formative stories and their heroes in the ancient world and stuff like that uh well 
when we talk about mythopoetics, we're talking about eschatology. Well, the opposite end of eschatology is doom, right? The end cycle, the end of a people. And science fiction deals with, and it's very fitting for people in modernity, uh, to come up with a mythopoetic genre, storytelling tradition that has to do with our doom. And our doom is very much tied up with technology because technology, we are, we are the technical animal as, uh, you know, was that Spengler, I believe called us. Uh, so, um, that is very much what, what we're nervous about what we're concerned with is where we're going. And that's what science fiction covers. So that's different than what we're talking about, which is a space opera and a space opera is mythopoetic insofar as it is a fantasy in space, Right. So with my setting, I use a lot of tried and true familiar tropes. I actually uh, don't like this word because it's it sort of has a negative connotation because modernists, liberals, and progressives uh, put too much emphasis on novelty. Novelty is good, and that which is new is always good for them, and that which old sucks. And I'm the opposite. I'm a traditionalist. I'm folkish. So that to me, that which is ancestral is immortal and beautiful and good. And that which goes forward is degeneration. So uh, let's call them motifs. I don't like the word trope. Let's call them motifs. There are a few planetary romance or space opera motifs that are tried and true and good, and you shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel with them. Um, some of them are are uh, things like uh, like things that are just universally cool. For example, humongous world destroying ships in space. It sort of makes no damn sense. It economically makes no sense. Militarily, it makes no sense. But it just goes hard, and it's yeah, yeah exactly. I was like, right. and yet, it's cool. <laughs> so, so in my setting, yeah, the, I believe in the rule of cool. If it's cool, just have it there because cool is cool, right? Uh, so, in my setting, there are humongous world destroying uh, behemoths in space, and they're called world crushers, and they are. Uh, pretty pivotal to this the 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 grand narrative of the setting Um, Uh, dave what what do these world crushers do if if you could explain it they crush worlds ah i should have (laughs) guessed yeah that's what they do so uh yeah that's um uh, that things like um uh for example the star wars trope where you have a like a sort of a revolutionary faction that kind of is opposed to a more traditional authoritarian faction except in 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 my setting uh because i am a traditionalist and i am folkish the i don't want to say good guys because um they're not really good you just it's really hard to explain you just you just have to go and you watch all of it and you will recognize the, the motifs that are there there are certain motifs that i think suck and i subverted them on purpose and there are ones that um I think that are beautiful and good and I kept, and there's a ton that are of, of my own creation. So red void. If you are a fan of star Wars, if you are a fan of Dune, if you're a fan of Warhammer 40 K red void is not going to be, is going to be completely familiar to you. And the things that you love from those settings are in it, but there's also a lot of, of stuff of my own invention that is completely, uh, that keeps it fresh and it has its own identity in my opinion. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to keep taking this back to 40K, but it's interesting you bring up the the trope of the revolution, right? Because to just explain to people who aren't familiar with the setting how unprogressive the world of 40K is, right? Is there is a revolutionary faction. You know, they're made up of workers rising up against oppressive conditions. But the secret is, right, they're not real people. You know, they're sort of half alien, half human hybrids. And their revolution culminates in building a beacon so that bug aliens can come and eat everyone, right? So it has all the trappings of the revolution, right? You know, they're rising up, you know, breaking their chains. But at the end, everyone gets eaten by aliens, right? Reduced to biomass. And yeah. so to take that sort of setting, right, which is just deeply reactionary at its core, and say, well, this they can be space racist, but, you know, they have to be equal opportunity space racists, of course. Like we have a DEI department and everything. It is on its face laughable. Yeah, that, that's interesting. You know, you you bring up this because there's sort of a negative, there's sort of a negative association to that word trope, right? It's this idea of being hackneyed. You know, you're just kind of copying things together. But to be honest, right, there's very vanishingly little truly original sci-fi, 
right? It, it's genre fiction, right? You're 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 sort of remixing certain ideas, and I really like you know science fiction because one, I think it is kind of like the prime, you know, like media of the the twentieth century, but also because it allows us to sort of play out certain ideas, right? And we live in the fallout of great social experiments, right? At times when we just decided, hey, wouldn't it be weird if, and then based an entire society off of that. And so to see that same thing kind of broadcasted in the future, I think it's just kind of inherently fascinating, right? Because from a certain perspective, we're living in it, or I guess the ashes of it. But nonetheless, you know, I think that that's the reason it speaks to us as, as modern so much. Yeah. I would, I would uh, make the distinction here also that uh, I am, I am an eternal, I'm a hyper romantic. I'm an expressionist. I, I believe very thoroughly that the first, the first goal of art is to thrust an experience upon somebody, to, to give them, to force them to have sensation, to, to like entertain them. That's your first job. And then great art is that which uh, leaves you with, with, challenging thoughts so i'm not saying i'm a, i'm a great artist i'm i'm a trying to be a great artist i'm trying to make great art and what red void does is um at the end of the day it it, it it's there to firstly to entertain and to just go hard and just be based uh secondly it it's there's kind of metaphysical contemplative elements so after you watch all of it now people you guys tuning in now are going to find it very familiar, but somebody that's your run of the mill normie kind of person is going to have to uh, come to terms with a few things in Red Void because it uh, it reveals to them that a lot of their priors and presuppositions aren't necessarily good, and they have to. And it comes down to kind of great man theory in a lot of ways, and it comes down to uh, a lot of times about loyalty and fealty. And how these things are sort of uh, more important than uh, ideological purity, or it's it's who your friends are, who you're loyal to, who you, who you like. So after you you dig into the main narrative of Red Void, uh, you you kind of come into this uh, thing where uh, the guy that originally gets proposed as the good guy, uh, who is like sort of like a god emperor type figure except he's a little bit he's a little bit more human he's a little bit more handsome he's more of a loving father type figure but he is also a tyrant and an authoritarian and he crushes anybody that that you know gets in his way that uh, stands in the way of his ambitions and his will and the will of what he believes to be uh, uh, commands from the divine and to fulfill his destiny and he's very very brutal but as a result of his brutality and his tyranny uh, comes an age of great prosperity and peace uh, and then after he's over, he makes some what is believed to be some pretty selfish choices, which I think are, are paramount for when you have an Ubermensch type character. When you have an Ubermensch, somebody like like an Odysseus, somebody like a like a, um, you know like a Beowulf, somebody like a Conan, they are sort of above the morality of of regular people. Uh, a lot of times, characters like Odysseus or Achilles make very selfish. They do very selfish things. Sometimes they're motivated just by ambition or impulse or lust. Sometimes they're lustful. Sometimes they're cruel. And this is uh, this is why I hate like, normie normie conservatives have this take. They have this take on on like, oh, I don't like my good guys to do bad stuff. And I I say fuck that. I I want my good guys to be to do bad stuff. It's like Robert E. Howard says. He says. Um, he says, my men, my my characters are more men than real men are. He says, they have hands and they have bellies. They lust and they hate. He says, scratch the skin of civilization and you will find the ape roaring and red-handed. And I just, I fuck with this quote so, so hard because it's so human, right? It's, it's, it's the dark, to, to have like somebody that is more human than human, not just to have the high noble things, but also to have the dark, toiling, brutal things as well. And I wanted to boil that into all of my Ubermensch characters. So when uh, Rex Ultima, after he falls, who's like the God Emperor type character, and his time passes, you get a, the rise of a very dark character 
who's um, I don't even want to call him the bad guy because you it's up to you to choose whether or not he is the bad guy. And he becomes what is called the Supreme Mortifex. And the Supreme Mortifex is is he is liberalism embodied incarnate. So uh, he believes in, in liberation ideology he believes in individualism and he he does all these kind of like dark rituals and he communes with these uh evil i don't want to say evil these like sinister uh space creatures these like um uh, ethereal beings called the noctophage and he communes with them and does dark rituals and becomes this sort of undead lich type being and through his machinations he takes control over the universe after the fall of uh Rex and you have to people are going to have to come to regular people for us it's not going to be as as hard but for regular people that get into the setting they're going to have to choose between the loving father and righteous beautiful uh, patriarch who crushes and stacks corpses or the guy who 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 is far less violent but is and and agrees with them on liter- almost everything but is is rotten and conniving and and dark and wicked so they're going to make this decision and um my goal has is is to uh really to subvert star wars i'm going to be honest not in the way that that our enemies do where to make it gay and silly and full of troons and changelings but to subvert it i like at its at its core that rebellion and individualism and liberalism are good and that authority and strength and these things are bad I want to, and I don't demonstrate the opposite. I, the, the viewer and the audience has to make the decision. So that's kind of what I, one thing that I very much, I, I love about Dune and I love about 40K is that it's not clear who the good guy and the bad guy are. You have to choose. You have to figure it out. You have to figure out who you're loyal to. Loyal to. And that, um, you know, uh, in, in 40k it says you know in in the far future there is only war right that's the, the the truth above all so what my setting says is that the the when you pass through the settings of time uh, or the the annals of time as heroes rise and kingdoms crumble the, the there's one truth that's sung above all and that the only thing that outnumbers the stars are the corpses of men as they paint the void red and that the cycle of war is forever more that the only truth that you can hang your hat on in this is this world is that men are going to rise and fall and in their wake they are going to have it's just going to be bloodshed and war and chaos and doom in between periods of peace and prosperity and and safety so that's the only thing that you can hang your hat on is that the cycle continues forevermore and that's it so that's what i wanted to uh, demonstrate in this setting is that uh, what matters at the end of the day is loyalty, is fealty, and who do you who do you swear to? Who do you, who do you like aesthetically, or or spiritually, or ideologically, or, or or based on blood, or like whatever? It's 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 up to the audience to choose who they like. So when this gets translated into tabletop game, what I the effect that I really wanted and something that I really love from Warhammer 40K is how passionate people get about their factions that they like. It's almost like a tribal thing. It's like a, it's like a simulacra of tribalism. And uh, and I'm not one of those people that thinks that simulacras are, are rotten. You know, I think that uh, in today's world, simulacras are good. You know, like martial arts is a simulacra. Going to the gym, getting fit is a simulacra. Let's be honest with us, with ourselves as men. Uh, the function of masculinity has been rendered obsolete by technological society. If you want to go out and really perform your mas- your masculine traits, you it, it is a, a a detriment to your uh, to your to your reproductive and financial interests. You will go to jail if you go and you do real man shit as man shit's supposed to be. It, the system will punish you. So we fill that hole with simulacras. Uh, performative things like going and getting jacked at the gym, going and doing martial arts and rings. And what I say is that those simulacras are good things because without them, you are going to feel very, very empty. So um, 
unfortunately, the reality is that we do have to have these simulacras and that there might not be a way back to the ancient world. So we have to uh, really lean into these simulacras and make them as as real, as hyper real as possible. So that's sort of what I want to do. And it's going back 40K. So you go to a 40K board, you're going to find Blood Angels fans. You're going to find Dark Angels fans. You're going to find, um, you know, uh, Word Bearers uh, fans. You're going to find Tyranid fans and Orc fans. And they all have an argument to why their faction is right and good and everybody else sucks. And I think that's fucking fun and dope. So I, I want that too. I want people that are, um, when they play the game, they get really into the Thosmok. They get really into the Theonic Order. They get really into uh, the, the Mongrel Horde and the, the Abominance and all of the different factions, the Dome Worlders. And that's their, those are their guys. And they, uh, you know, beef with all the other factions in this simulacra. So, I put a lot. I put might have put a little too much thought in all this. No, no, not well. I think it's it's actually it's something worth talking about. Uh, I mean, really, that's why I had you on the podcast, right? Is that you know, there's there's this great book, you know, Pulp Fascism by Jonathan Bowden. I, I reference it all the time, and you know, he talks about how you know there are ideas, you know, there's this kind of like real man stuff you're talking about that have sort of been driven out of polite society. Right, like you can't write an opera like like Wagner did, you know. You can't do that anymore for any number of reasons. But those are human. They're they're a real part of you know what it means to be, you know, a Homo sapien. And so it's still buried deep in your brain. And that yeah. found an outlet, but it found an outlet in low brow in scare quotes media, you know, over the last really hundred years. And so. You know, you, you mentioned this distinction between being a good artist and a great artist, right? And there's a lot of good pulp. There's some great pulp. And, you know, obviously, you know, there it's debatable, you know, what's in and out of that book or in and out of that group, right? People say, you know, Lovecraft is or isn't. No one really argues about Howard. You know, I like Moorcock. Some people don't think he's all that great. But in, in all of those, right, they are entertaining, right? It's something that grabs you by the nose and leads you along. It's very dynamic, right? Like the way that... uh the way that uh you know the conan stories are are written right like he he does fight choreography like a movie almost you know you're you're pulled yeah. into the action but there there's real themes there worth discussing right like oh you know when, when conan you know beats this ape you know that's been locked in the wizard's basement and it's sort of this monster eating brains out of skulls you know he turns around and says like i didn't kill an animal today i killed a man you know because he fought well and fought honorably and there's a discussion there. There's something to be said. That's an idea, right? That's more than just two muscle man fight. Now, don't get me wrong. That fighting's pretty rad. You know, that's why you're there. But there's something, you know, there's something buried in it. And, you know, like you said, you know, so many of these things we sort of have to, at least for the time being, we have to simulate. You know, you're not allowed to, you know, unless maybe you're a Somalian or, a, you know, a Haitian. You're not allowed to get a war band together and, and stack skulls into a pyramid, right? It's generally yeah. frowned upon. We, we signed any number of treaties about the practice. But, you know, that's still a, a part of your brain to activate. And I, I think that, you know, you're 100% right. And I wish you all the best you know, with your endeavors. We do have a super chat uh, by the F artist uh, for four ninety nine. <laughs> I get the dumbest super chats, man. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, Red Void has my attention. Any way to get involved in playtesting? Yeah, hit me up on Telegram. Well, great. Uh, I think I know who that is, unfortunately, but I'll be... Uh... <laughs> I like it. I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's not his worst name. I'll put it that way. But anyway, man, <laughs> uh, if people want to reach out and see your stuff, we have links, but uh, you know, what, do you, what are you really working on? I know we've mentioned your... Uh, your game but where can people find more of your stuff just check me out on check me out on telegram uh i believe i'm at the bog lord follow me on twitter and telegram at the bizarre archives or my personal account at big dave martell which i just actually just made a, a twitter account again after i got wiped off years back so i guess they just let me back on so go to at uh at big dave martell i believe and follow me there you can also check out i have a sub stack for uh, the Bizarre Archives at theobelisk.substack.com. Uh, you can check out my other podcasts, like Culture Dads. That's Culture Dads 
That's culture with a K, culturedads.com, and follow the links there. It's behind a paywall. Lots of great content there. I'm all over the place. I should probably come up with a link tree because I have so much stuff. But what I'm working on right now is actually uh, this. I'm doing a short film. We're doing a sci-fi horror short film. It's the first time I ever did a film. I've never been involved with film before in my life. Uh, we have a very, very small budget. And I want to see if we can use AI tools and, and all this technology at our disposal to make a, an interesting, good film with uh, an iPhone and two dudes that have an idea. So, you know, we're, we'll see how it goes. I want to, I, my goal is I, I want to, I want to give, show everybody that it is possible. Uh, long story short, I'm not, I'm not going to keep talking and talking, but a few years back, I believe it was on Millennial. Morgoth was on there and they're asking him a bunch of questions and they said, how are we going to, how are we going to make our own film? How are we going to make video games? How are we going to make this? How are we going to make that? And I love, this isn't a shot at Morgoth. I love Morgoth. Morgoth is tremendous, but he said something that I hated. He said that, uh, yo, we can't really do that because you know, it takes this much. We can't do that. He was, he was very black pilled about this. So I was, pulled out a little notepad and I wrote down everything that he said that uh, he thinks we can't do. And I aim to prove Morgoth wrong. And I want to uh, prove everybody wrong. And I want to show everybody that we can do it and you can do it. And anybody, all you need is a you know, little bit of money, some guys that are completely nutty and obsessed with the idea and some drive. You have, you have love and obsession towards your creation. You can find a way to do it. You can find a way to do it. Uh, my first real quick story, my first son, um, when we had my first son, I was freaked out. You know what I mean? I, I, I lost my job at the time. Uh, I, uh, things were going real wrong for me and I, we didn't have anything ready. We weren't ready. My, the baby was coming. My wife was freaked out. I was freaked out. And we had a, actually a really cool, uh, OB doctor. He's a Hindu guy, Indian guy. And, um, I asked him, I said, you know, I'm not ready for the, I'm not ready for the baby. You know, what am I going to do? This is this and that. And he said something very simple to me at the time. I, I was like, what a fucking jerk off. But he goes, uh, he says, uh, uh, now you are not ready, but soon the baby will be here and then you will be ready. And I thought he was a jerk off. I was like, what the fuck's that mean, dude? That doesn't help me at all. And guess what? My baby came and I got ready and I made it happen. And that taught me. You can make it happen. Do you love this? Are you about it? Get obsessed with it. Stay up late. Wake up early. Put in everything you have. Go hard. If you are willing to go hard and be filled with fire and passion and obsession, you can make it happen. And another thing I do want to say real quick, and we mentioned about good art versus great art. Don't be afraid to, you know, when I first rolled out Bizarre archives, and I'll never forget this, one of these like persnickety ass little you know, critique trolls came at me. He said something in the comment. I don't even know what his name was. Some nobody. He goes, uh, leave it up to Martell to make proto comics when we should be writing symphonies. <laughs> and I was like, I just laughed so hard. And I kept, I've kept that with me for like years now because it was such an egregiously retarded statement to say. Right. Because uh, this guy he's like, where's your symphonies, bro? You write a symphony. OK, good. Good talk. Don't be afraid to go out, roll out pretty goodness. And most importantly, don't be afraid to suck. Your first of everything is going to suck. The first everything that every great man ever did sucked. Think of your great, your most favorite artist, the most tremendous guy that you've ever that you can think of that inspires you. Your favorite author, your favorite musician, your favorite whatever, your favorite creator ever. The first couple things he ever, probably the first 10, 20 things he ever did sucked. Don't be afraid to suck because uh, even if it sucks a little bit, if it has heart, your, your audience, your viewers will be like, okay, that sucked, but I liked it. There's lots of stuff that sucks that I like. I love B movies, shitty eighties, low budget B movies. I love them. I think they're tremendous because there's heart in there. Don't be afraid to suck. Don't be afraid to roll out pretty goodness. People love pretty goodness all the time. So it's got to start somewhere and don't be afraid. Just do it. Get obsessed. Fall in love with it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's actually an attitude, you know, I take to my own creative endeavors, right? There's a reason that I, I always, I try to put out a sub stack once a week. 
I've been more successful in that some months than others. But the idea is, right, you know, writing is not my my primary mode of expression. You know, it's something that I have maybe a certain talent for, but is something I need to get better at. And so that process of iterating, right, which is like you're, you're doing your reps effectively is really helpful. It's, it's the same reason, right, that I, I do three podcasts a week and I've been doing it for a long time. Right. And it's because, well, certainly, you know, any one of these things can be considered an art form. A large part of art is the having the skill set, right? Having your, your basis covered. And, you know, one of the things you've seen in any kind of creative endeavor, and if you've ever been to a creative writing workshop, you've probably seen this. I cannot recommend the experience. But you see people hiding behind, hiding their lack of knowledge about a form, their lack of knowledge about the way you're supposed to do it behind abstraction you know they don't know the rules or they're not good enough at them so they say well that was never my intention to begin with you know they sort of subvert the whole thing but you're right right you have to start off at pretty good and you know what maybe you're this you know once in a generation genius but the math says you probably aren't and if you're maybe not a once in generation genius but let's just be honest a slightly above average chap you know you can still write you know, you can still write well, but you're going to need to put your reps in just like you would at, at anything else. And so to me, that kind of like persnickety attitude, I have no patience for it. Uh, those people are, are not worth anyone's time. And uh, yeah, iteration is very important to art. Yeah, exactly. Just go hard, dude. People love. So uh, pretty recently I was at an event and there's like a lot of people at the event. And um, so, you know, faith event is a you know, pagan event. And I've never really recited my, I'm a, I'm a poet too. So I've never really recited my poetry because it's kind of weird and offbeat. I do like cosmic horror poetry. So it's kind of like, you know, it's not really what modern people think of when they think of poetry and it's really wordy and it's ornate. It's, it's completely bizarre, right? It's completely weird. Like everything that I do. So I've never like really, a lot of people don't really fuck with it. I don't really like it. I've never read it to anybody. But I was like, you know what? I want to recite a poem for everybody. And I recited one of my poems. And I forgot one of the stanzas uh, off the top of my head. I was a little, it was like, you know, but I read it and I just poured my myself into it. And I orated and I waved my hands and I just got, I got into it as hard as I could. And motherfuckers loved it. People stood up, started clapping. And they just, let me tell you, if you go hard and your heart is into it, that which is passionate is better than that which is good. So if you put your heart into it and you just go hard, people will see that. People appreciate that. Authenticity is one of the most important things. Heart, authenticity, and passion are, you know, look at, look at, we've been, we've been busted on Hollywood this whole time. We've been busted on the machine and all the crap that they put out. You buy a book from them, you watch a movie they put out millions and millions sometimes billions of dollars of budget polished all the way and everybody hates it meanwhile you got indie books that are just written by a guy that he published himself or or little short films that people put up on youtube or uh like demos and albums that people recorded in their basements and people fall in love with it dude just do it make it happen and support those who do support it financially you mentioned something earlier I, I forgot to touch on i'm sorry we're running over but no 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 about, man. Go about ahead. this is good about kanye west making more sales than the beatles they're lying about what sale means they changed the definition of what sale means there's a big difference between paying a dollar 99 on spotify and buying an album right the people back in the day bought albums and that was a big deal where you spend your money the stuff that you buy Dude, it goes a long way. When you buy a book from me, that's huge, right? You buy a book from me, that's huge for us. You buy a book from Simon, Simon and Schuster, that's just like a drop in the bucket. So I know that it's like there's a question. It's questionable about whether or not boycotts work or voting with your dollar. But on this level where I'm at and where guys like me are at, and shout out to all my my brothers in the pulp scene all my brothers in the creative scene in the underground, you know, your dollar is, is such a huge vote. And every time you buy something, the next thing we put out is going to be even better. So, you know, buy books, <laughs> buy books. 
Yeah, there, there's something to that, right? You know, and I don't want to get into, you know, a theological, a theological discussion, right? That's not my point. But, you know, there is this idea of uh, the, the concept of worship in the attention economy are not really disconnected, right? That idea that, you know, what you value is what you, you devote your resources to, whether that be, you know, uh, you know, monetary, physical, spiritual, anything. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you say, you know, when you announce, right, you know, I'm this big dissident guy, you know, I, I hate the regime. I hate everything they stand for. Fair enough. I mean, I'm in the same boat with you, but you, you take your, your time and your money and you pour it back into that, you know, your hate watching quote unquote, their material, you're still buying it. And look, I realize we live in their world. It's impossible to be pure on this front. But it's like, well, there's a there's a difference. There's a gap between your stated and your revealed preference, right? You 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 preach one thing, you practice another. And so, to me, right, it, I, I view it as sort of the, you know, one of the best things you can do is sort of keep money in the system, right? You know, I, I basically dump almost all the money I receive on Substack into other Substacks, right? Because yeah. it's like, well, I I don't need this, you know. It's not like this is the thing keeping me off the street. And you know what? I'd rather throw some throw some money towards some guys who are doing good work and you know who knows maybe they're doing the same thing and this is just a giant circular economy of people thinking they're smart on the internet but nonetheless right better they get the money than these kind of soulless soulless hacks but uh dave we're we're a little bit past time man again this has been a great conversation i enjoyed it a lot and uh i'll have to have you on again sometime absolutely i'd love to as far as my stuff, you can find The Jay Burden Show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to support us more directly, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching is my partner. I'm proud to be working with them. They're doing great stuff. JD, the owner, personal friend of mine, and uh, we're growing a lot. We basically had a 10% month over month increase, and uh, more guys are, are dropping in and getting connected. And honestly, the, the programming is great. I'm not going to lie, but the community is really the fun part. I think the entire group chat just posted cats today, almost no fitness content. So I uh, highly recommend it. It's normally more topical than that. Uh, and also, like I said, I have a sub stack. And to everyone at home, remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.